Hello, my name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and I'd like to welcome you to this Vlog 15. And the title of Vlog 15 is Where Will I Work? Education Cities. Many of you have emailed me about the question, what's next? what happens after your PhD and indeed the wonderful Erin sent me an email with about 15 questions and possible vlog topics about what's next. So this vlog is really the first moment in that discussion. We're going to explore the nature of work, working and cities. The overwhelming majority of universities are in cities. There's a diversity of universities and there's diversity of cities. And so we're going to explore that diversity and the potential of that diversity for you today. So I want to have a really honest conversation with you about your future and your future workplace. This is a professional vlog, but it is also asking you to think about your personal goals and how that inflects and informs your future professional life. The place of work matters a great deal because it is the framework for your scholarship, the framework for your teaching, the framework for your research. And my first full-time academic post took me out of Australia and I travelled to Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It was for a one-year academic contract, particularly a teaching contract. And I always remember my first night in this truly dreadful cellar flat, cellar room really, in Wellington. I'd left my wonderful life behind me in Perth in Western Australia. It was a life of friends and family and music and dancing. And I'd landed in Wellington not knowing a soul and having to reboot my entire life. And I remember on the first night when I was laying in my bed in this cold, really, really cold Wellington cellar flat that I remember really sobbing, that deep sobbing, that deep cry, thinking, what have I done? And yet knowing that if I went back home and walked away from this first academic post, I would never get a chance to work in universities again. So I stayed and I survived and I thrived and the scholar I am today was built with that first academic job in Wellington. Wellington is a wonderful city. I made incredible friends there, taught some of the best students in the world. It was amazing. But cue 21 years later, on Easter Monday this year, I flew into Adelaide alone, not knowing a single soul, and once more, I landed and was about to live in a cellar flat, indeed, a cellar room. And if possible, this room was even worse than the one I was living in in Wellington. In fact, it was the worst room I had ever seen in my entire life. Your entrance to this particular cellar was at the back of the house. And when I walked past the front lawn, I saw, hmm, there's a decaying stove and a decaying lounge suite in the middle of the front lawn. So once more on that Easter Monday this year, I sat on the bed of this decrepit, dirty cellar flat and started to cry, thinking once more, what have I done? I'm telling you these stories because academic mobility is hard. It is tough, but it's also an incredible pleasure, an amazing gift, because if I hadn't come to Adelaide, I wouldn't be in this fantastic job and I wouldn't have a chance to be working with you all now. So I survived both those cellars and I lived to tell the tale. But the question is, what will your tale be? So I've called this topic today education cities. So what I'm trying to do is help you understand the shape of education cities, where we work and the impact of where we work on what we do. 
and so that you receive the full portfolio of options once more this week I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to talk to Steve as a lot of you know our night job outside of our responsibilities at Flinders University uh, we involve, are involved in being city imaging scholars and city imaging practitioners around the world. We help men and women understand the best way to develop cities in terms of urban development. That's what we do. So we're going to use a little bit of that expertise to help you today. So urban planners, urban theorists, city imaging scholars tend to structure cities into tiers to help us understand policy, to help us understand the theory of urbanity. And so those tiers through which we think about cities are global cities, second tier cities, and third tier cities. So think of them very much as tiers. Global, second tier, third tier. Global cities, most famously studied by the wonderful scholar Saskia Sassen, are globalising cities and they're categorised by sameness. So finance capital, stock markets exist in those places and so do the corporation headquarters for these international firms. So we're talking about Sydney, we're talking about New York, London, Mumbai, Tokyo, Beijing. So people and money move between these places and they also tend to be, tragically, the focus of terrorism as well. When terrorism events happen, they tend to be in these global cities. Now also, a lot of universities exist in these cities. Between 10 and 20 universities exist in each global city. So there are plenty of academic posts in London and in Sydney, but there are a lot of problems that you confront when you're living in these areas. So for example, real estate is incredibly expensive, transportation, it's very difficult to get around, and infrastructure can often be mm, quite decrepit. They're also very competitive to attain posts, so a lot of scholars want to work in London. So it's quite competitive to get a post and therefore quite difficult to help your spouse gain a post in those cities. Second tier cities are the non-capital city in nation states and they're defined relationally in response to global cities. So we're talking about Melbourne, Manchester, Alexandria, Perth, Adelaide, Osaka. These cities gain the advantage through aggregation of services. So particularly for health, particularly for education, we also see a diverse workforce. This means they're of a size whereby if you need to see a doctor, you can. If you want to put your children into schools, there is a diversity of schools in which you can place them. There's also a range of employment opportunities both inside and outside the university system. Second tier cities tend to have between three and five universities within them. So we haven't got the range of universities that we find in global cities, for example, but you do tend to see that staff move between the universities in second tier cities. And we see that a lot in Australia, not only in Adelaide, but also in Brisbane and also in Perth. Second tier cities also display spikes in fame, such as Liverpool and the Beatles, Manchester and Asset House, Seattle and Grunge. Transportation is often pretty good and commuting times are often excellent as well because it's a suburban life. So you can live in a suburb that is adjacent to the university. So when I was working at Murdoch University in Perth, I literally lived across the way. I crossed one street to get to work. Similarly in Adelaide, I am 10 minutes away from the university. So it's quite good, it's a good lifestyle. Let's move therefore to third tier cities. These are small cities and large towns. They are deeply neglected in 
the research literature. Event management in tourism tends to talk about them and I particularly would like to log the work of David Bell and Mark Jane. They are the great scholars of the third tier city. But they are invisible in so much of the urban literature and there is a reason for that. Not only are they small, but they're also deeply troubled. They're often called edge lands and all sorts of problems are emerging in these third tier cities. They confront most importantly a lack of stable and diverse employment. Examples of these cities include Bathurst, Wagga Wagga, Invercargill, Stoke, Bolton, Eastbourne, Windsor, Oshawa. Many are former manufacturing cities. They had one industry and then that industry left. So they are cities without a purpose. They lack a strong employment base. They also lack health and educational opportunities. And they often only feature one university or indeed the outlier campus of second and global tier cities universities. So the challenge in the third tier city that we as academics have to manage is they are the easiest places to get a university job. But if that job, if that contract runs out, then you're going to have to leave that city and go somewhere else because there's not a diversity of employment. So the advantages are an ease of employment through a lack of competition, really, really cheap real estate, and a greater ability for your spouse to get a job both inside and outside the university. So as you can see, cities really matter to us. As academics, they are our workplace. They are the context for our research and the context for our teaching. So where do you want to live? Where do you want to work? Let's go downstairs and talk to Steve and help you evaluate your future options. Hi again, Steve. Hi again, Tara. Right, well today we're talking about cities and universities and possible employment for our students out there. So, are you ready to go? I am. Now, you and I have worked through a diversity of cities, some of the best cities in the world, some of the worst cities in the world, and some of the best universities in the world, and indeed, some of the worst universities in the world. So, why does a city matter to a university and to university academics? I think there's a particular connection now between cities, especially global cities, and globalisation. I think in the past you would talk about university cities, you know, people talked in the 50s about university cities, Oxford or whatever. But actually, as higher education has expanded in all countries, the, the actual issue is not so much to do with university and the city, it's to do with what's happening in globalisation and the city. And globalisation, as uh, we sit in the ruins of the Australian electoral, si electoral system <laughs> this morning, um, is actually everywhere. There is a real issue to do with what globalisation is doing and how people around the world are connected to it. And I think it, it's particularly to do with that that the city is important as far as education, particularly higher education, is concerned. So do you think, therefore, that we... I just introduced to the students mm. the city modelling, the global, mm. second tier and third tier. And third tier do, yeah. do you think the differences between the universities and between the cities, that the differences are contracting, do you think? Yeah, I think so, yes. Globalisation is having all sorts of effects, and globalisation and higher education are having all sorts of effects, and that's one of them. Right. Well, what I want to do now is go to those cities that are at the cusp or the edge of globalisation and particularly talk about third tier cities. Now, you and I have recently worked in third tier cities in the United Kingdom, in Canada and in Australia. So, what do you see as the great strength in working in a university in these small cities and large towns? Well, your, your idea of education cities is very important here, I think, and you've done a lot of research into that. Your concept of education cities is really important. 
But I think you're right. I mean, certainly in terms of our experience of third tier cities, there is something happening in um, those sorts of cities which wasn't happening before. And I think, again, it's partly due to globalisation. Um, those cities are actually almost dependent on the university, on higher education as an industry. Now, that hasn't happened before. And we've certainly experienced that. Uh, we've, we've seen it with our own undergraduate students, but particularly postgrad students. People who wouldn't necessarily have gone to these cities in the past have now new opportunities because they are education cities. Exactly, and also one of the strengths I think is because it is a small environment, and particularly we found this in Bathurst, but yep. also in Bolton, also yep. in Oshawa, yep. you have a much more direct link with, say, local government. So mm. we had in Bathurst a direct link with the Mayor of Bathurst yes. and directly informed and inflected creative industries and tourism policy yeah, in that very city. Much so. so it's easier to make those sort of relationships, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I, I was really surprised, I must admit. Um, that we certainly in Bathurst we were able to develop that, but I think in, in other cities of, of similar size, you are actually able to, if, you, if, you're a, if, you, if you've got expertise in a particular area, city cultures is one um, that we were able to sell ourselves as. And also sport, leisure as well. Absolutely, including those things, you are actually able to have a direct relationship to local government. That, that proved to be an excellent part of our time at Charles State University. And our postgrads really benefited from that. Very well said. We're now going to get to the very negative part of this conversation because these small cities are confronting extraordinary challenges to their mm. economic and social structures. So what do you think are the problems in these small cities and these large towns, particularly logging that a lot of our PhD students watching this vlog may end up, in fact probably will end up, in their first job getting it in a small city? Yeah, I think the downside is that because the, these sorts of cities are so dependent on the higher education industry, yeah. if things go wrong there, yeah. then there is no base outside of it. Um, and we saw that to some extent in, in Bathurst most recently, uh, where there was a start, starting to be a decline in the university and higher education industry, partly because of government policy, but also for other reasons as well. And the precariousness of that relationship between the city and the university is really manifest in those cities. Um, I think that, that it, it creates opportunities but also creates the problems. And I, I think as, I would argue, globalisation really starts to go into reverse, you're going to have more and more problems of precariousness in those sorts of cities. So I think you have to be pretty uh, prepared to move on if necessary. Um, both, both as academics and as uh, postgraduates, it's not going to stay the same. Very powerful. The volatility, I yeah. think, Steve, is yeah, captured volatility. really yeah. well there. We've also spent, though, probably the bulk of our professional lives in second-tier mm. cities. Perth, now Adelaide, Manchester, and also beautiful Vancouver as well. Are these cities like Goldilocks's chair? Not too big, not too small, but just right. I personally think so, and I'm not trying to sell myself to Adelaide <laughs> just because we're here now. But I, I, I do think it's quite interesting that, um, whereas I found a city like Sydney, where we were, uh, you know, we were connected to for the last four years, uh, although four hours drive away, actually, um, for all sorts of reasons, a problem. Uh, I, I, I work well, I think, in other global cities, but I didn't really go on in Sydney. And I think Adelaide is a great example. Um, of an education city, post-industrial city, you know, manufacturing going down. Tonsley, Hyder Tonsley. Absolutely, and the idea of a city built around popular culture, for example, which is a real possibility in Adelaide, the idea of a festival city, as it's called. Um, I think there are all sorts of possibilities in a city like this, very similar to Perth, similar to Perth in Western Australia, where I, I worked for Jeff Gallup a, de a decade ago, in terms of creating uh, a creative WA. I think the idea of a creative SA, creative SA, is a really good example as well. And I think one of the reasons is because of its size. And it's linked particularly, as I found in Adelaide, to four universities, 
um, to really interesting dynamics between those four universities. So I think it is to do with size, but it's also to do with the way in which these cities fit into globalisation. You can do a great deal now with second tier cities, which you couldn't do perhaps 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, because of digitisation, I yep, think it's worth absolutely. It. Mobile city cultures, as I've called them, yeah. theorising them after Paul Virilio. I think you're absolutely right. There's something happening here yeah. to do with mobility, digitisation, deglobalisation. Yeah, and also you've got all the analogue advantages too, like a great music industry, yep. great sporting industries. Mm. So they're very pleasant places to live, which we may return to in a second. Mm. But picking up on your Sydney comment, mm. let's talk about global cities. Global cities are really, really challenging. Some of the best universities in the world are based in these global cities, without a doubt. But there's simply issues, as you and I have found, with the running of a day-to-day -day life. How many hours, nay days, nay weeks, have I spent trying to negotiate London's transportation system, for example, mm -hmm. Sydney's infrastructure. My life just simply got lost in the Rex Lounge waiting for transit. And I, I do think Sydney Airport is the worst airport in the world. So there's all these sorts of challenges. I think Toronto is better, mm -hmm. mainly because they've committed to, I think, public transportation in particular. But what do you think for our students is the big challenge in managing these mega cities? I think there are challenges, but I also think you need to emphasise why they're attractive, particularly for students and for academic stuff. Um, they're exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and there are reasons why globalisation, particularly over the last 20 years or so, drove itself through big cities, through world cities. Yeah. And you mentioned Toronto, uh, Sydney and some of these others which we've worked in. Um, Universities in those cities are important, but they, they're not education cities in the same way as we've been talking about in, a, in other senses. And actually, universities, partly because I think they've lost their purpose in general, um, have really struggled in these cities. Yeah. They really don't know uh, how to brand themselves. Uh, you know, are they corporations? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe not, but they... They're starting to look rather um, out of touch in a lot of global cities. And I know it's a problem for academics, a uh, problem for postgraduates, and, and for postgraduates trying to get their jobs, which is why they may be better off looking in the second and third, third tier cities, actually. Yeah, very good point. I also wanted to talk about spousal policies, Stephen. This is quite a controversial area, but as always in these blogs, I think we should go there so people are aware of the language and the debates around these issues. A lot of North American universities have spousal policies in place, which means that people like you and I, academic marriages, we can actually survive and we can live in a, a city and live in a university and have that stability of a workplace, yeah? Mm. Obviously, you're Steve Redhead, I'm Tara Brabazon, we've both been professors for a very long time, mm. so it's easier for us to move around than perhaps some of our PhD students. But yes. what do you think is the advantage of a spousal policy? Why does Australia not have them, and should we? I think there's... There is great advantage, uh, not just from this point of view, but actually, you know, universities, we're talking about precariousness and globalisation, deglobalisation. What universities need in many ways is stability in their employment practices. You know, a lot of people are employable, but actually, you know, if, you, if as we found, you know, I, we were uh, split 15 years ago between Perth and Manchester, for example, I did 8,000 mile commutes. Um, and, if, and a lot of people are doing those, you know, those sorts of things in globalisation. Yeah. But actually stability is crucial. Um, and stability in terms of people's relationships, as we actually talked about in another vlog, um, is absolutely critical in the, the contemporary academy. So I think the idea, particularly in North America, of um, Spousal policy, which we benefited from, I think is an excellent idea. I think it should be extended. I cannot understand why other, other countries don't do it. I really cannot understand it. It's, it. It seems to me to be absolutely sensible to do it. Yeah, and, and the pressure on relationships. I will tell the Brighton story, mm. by the way. The pressure on relationships 
for two academics is incredible, guys. I'll yeah. give you the Brighton example. Steve got a, pro a professorial post at the University of Brighton, one of the great universities in the world, magnificent city. Everybody wants to live yep. and work in Brighton, yeah. like everybody wants to live and work in Manchester. These are great cities. And one professorial post came up that I could apply for. I had one shot, one shot, to gain a professorial post and join Steve because there was no spousal policy in place. So hundreds of the best scholars on the planet mm. applied for this job and I fought my way through and you remember the shortlist, yes. amazing scholars, scholars were shortlisted and I had to fight my way through and it really was, I had one chance to, to get there and I pulled it off, but the incredible slog, I mean, you had to be sort of a Tara Brabazon yeah, yeah. to do it really so. Outstanding teaching, outstanding research, and arrive able to really fire and fire up postgraduate students. But the pressure that I still remember the night before that interview, I, I kept on thinking, I've got one chance here, and if I fail tomorrow, and I did treat it like failing, mm. if I fail tomorrow, then we'll just have to reorganise our entire lives. Mm. So this is a, a major area, isn't it? Mm. Well, I think I said to you, you know, if you, if you fail, we'll go back to Australia, basically. Um, but I think that, that, that's a great example of, uh, of how difficult it is. Um, and that's why the spousal matters. Partly because people in, in academic relationships are very often in different stages of their career, which we were certainly at that time. Um, you, you need, as I say, you need stability, but you need a policy which provides long-term stability for that relationship. You're always, as universities, you're always going to get the best out of people when they're stable. Yeah, and it's not job, jobs for mates. We're not talking about no. doing deals and all the rest of it. This is about transparent procedure, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And I think... The thing about spousal is that very often it is going to link people in, say, first, you know, first tier cities and second tier cities, or maybe second tier cities and third tier cities. You're not necessarily going to be in the same place always. Yeah, yeah that's right. The, and again, linking with the conversation we just had too, one of my favourite articles on the planet was written by Mitchell et al. And it was called, mm. quote, The Geography of Happiness, which I just truly adore. So for you, what creates that livability for academics in cities? I think it varies, but I think um, particularly if, if you're working in sort of areas that, that we are, you know, working, a lot of our work has been in city cultures from an interdisciplinary point of view. Um, you want to be able to live in those cities and actually, div, you know, riff off the, the, the culture in order to do your work. Um, I think it's just about... Um, pleasure and leisure. I think it often is about work, actually. So that idea of geography of happiness is actually very important. It's productive in terms of academic development as well. Yeah, I agree with that. And last question, Stephen. I wanted to finish off by talking about PhDs and mobile doctoral education and mobile doctoral students. Yeah. Three of our PhD students live in third tier cities. So we've got Mark, in Port Macquarie, we've got the wonderful Mick in the Napa Valley, and we've got Anne in Dubbo. And we should do a shout out to all our dear friends in Dubbo. We miss you very much, we love you very much. But we supervise those students in third tier cities from Adelaide, from the second tier city, yep. via weekly meetings through Skype. So, how do you think doctoral education and doctoral supervision is transforming? via digitisation that's linking up the second tier cities with the third tier cities? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I really, I've really i experienced that through, through Skype and uh, how important that has been to uh, you know, basically shrink time and space. Um, and that's really what I was thinking about when I was developing that idea of mobile city cultures, which was originally from the work of Paul Verilia, but I kind of overdubbed it. Yeah. Um, and I think... What I'm experiencing now in those sorts of supervision, I've also got supervisions in uh, first tier cities like Toronto, for example, but the, the interesting thing about the way we're doing it now is that you've got a hub of, say, Adelaide as a city, Flinders as a university, but we're able to bring in people from the third tier cities, our postgraduate students, as if they were here. I really don't think there's a, a difference anymore um, and that is creating really interesting ways of supervision and, and teaching and so on 
but actually providing them uh, a, a community. It's mobile city cultures in that sense. It's actually not the case that they feel divorced or alienated from it. And their work is actually being transformed through that. Yes. I think it's really important that we keep going with that. And I, I remember Mark particularly from Port Macquarie yeah. said to us, he feels like he's part of something Absolutely. bigger. He always said an opportunity that would not have been available to him in Port Macquarie yeah. is now available. So yeah. noting that, of course, Flinders has great relationships with Alice Springs and also with mm. Darwin. This is incredibly important, I yeah. think. We're displacing place. We are. So I want to thank Steve so much for this conversation. Erin, I hope this was useful to you, thinking about work, thinking about education, and thinking about cities. So Steve, if you're happy, you and I will do one more session next week addressing something I've talked about in a few of these vlogs, and that is the nature of the toxic workplace. So because it's such a negative, upsetting and distressing topic, I will drag you into that topic with me. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope this has been a useful discussion for you. I hope you have a fantastic week. And as always, I wish you love, light and peace. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.